good crowd. I hope the earlier time on Friday helped out the attendance situation. Um, I don't know if this will be the norm, but it um, seems like a good idea. All right, so I'm Matt Morissette. I'm one of the critical care clinical pharmacists here. And I'll be presenting with Amanda Lazuski, who's also on the critical care team. And we'll be discussing strategies for managing the patient with complicated alcohol withdrawal syndrome. There we go. Okay, so brief outline of our presentation. Um, I'm going to start out with some brief review of pathophysiology, role of neurotransmitters, and how those play into the clinical manifestations that we see in these patients. Then I'm going to hand it off to Amanda, who's going to discuss, discuss current treatment strategies focusing on the use of benzodiazepines and phenobarbital. And then I'll come back and close up with the role of Um and then we will both touch on briefly, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but the current <clears throat> UVA alcohol withdrawal protocol or, or excuse me, guideline is currently being revised. Um, so we'll touch on a few components of that. Unfortunately, it's not finalized and we were hoping it was gonna be a little further down the road, um, but we'll shed some light on that as we can. All right, so alcohol use disorder, ethanol is the second most commonly abused psychoact psychoactive substance behind caffeine, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Um, total lifetime prevalence around 30%, so one out of three patients, or one out of three people will experience some sort of alcohol use disorder in their lifetime. This is a pretty high rate. Um, 10 to 33% of patients admitted to ICU will have some sort of alcohol use disorder. And this increases their risk for mechanical ventilation <clears throat> by nearly 50%, morbidity and mortality by nearly two to four times, and this is usually secondarily due to increased infection rate, um, cardiopulmonary insufficiency, and bleeding disorders. And then can also prolong their ventilator days and ICU length of stay. So as you can see, it's a huge burden on our healthcare system and something we should be actively trying to find better ways to manage. All right, so the clinical manifestations we see in our patient that's withdrawing from alcohol is really driven by the effect and imbalances in neurotransmitters. And we have a couple of different neurotransmitters involved, and we see different effects, whether it's an acutely intoxicated patient or a patient that's actively withdrawing. <clears throat> so the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in our body, GABA, or gamma-aminobutyric acid, um, we see an increase in acute intoxicated states, which leads to sedation and discoordination, whereas in withdrawal, we see deficiencies in this neurotransmitter pathway, leading to both anxiety and insomnia and potentially seizures. Um, in opposition to GABA, we have the primary excitatory neurotransmitter, which is glutamate or L-glutamic acid, which we see de decreased in acute intoxicated states leading to memory disruption and increase in withdrawal states leading to delirium and then potentially seizures as well. Epinephrine is increased in both acute and withdrawal settings, more so in the withdrawal setting leading to hypertension and tachycardia. Then we also see effects on serotonin and dopamine, which lead to some of our neuropsychiatric complications. <clears throat> All right, so really the underlying primary mechanism of alcohol, acute intoxication and, intoxication and withdrawal is the balance between GABA and glutamate <clears throat> and insufficiencies in these pathways um, in each disease state respectively. Um, so in our normal person, who doesn't abuse um, GABAergic or excitatory substances, these two pathways exist in harmony. So our GABA or inhibitory pathways balance out our glutamate and excitatory pathways, sort of in homeostasis. Now, if you take a trip out of the vineyards and drink a bottle of wine one day, but you don't have a chronic history of this um, activity and become acutely intoxicated, this orange bar represents ethanol acting on the GABA receptor. So you get an increase in this inhibitory pathway. Now you go home, sleep it off, wake up with a headache. These two pathways return back to homeostasis and equal each other out. <clears throat> so no issues. Now when you're a chronic alcohol user, you can see on the left here, when you chronically ingest alcohol, you chronically elevate this GABA pathway and you chronically live at the top of this orange bar here. 
Now, when you have that chronic elevation and GABA activity, the glutamate wants to balance the stuff self out because we want to live in homeostasis. So your body starts to upregulate glutamate activity and glutamate receptors, creating a new baseline activity, which you can see over to the right here. In addition, we start to deregulate GABA activity because this has been um, elevated for such a chronic period of time. Um, so we create these new baseline activities in both aspects. Now, when the chronic alcoholic stops drinking ethanol, which is acting on our GABA receptor, you create this um, deficiency in GABA agonism. And this is really where our therapeutic um, treatments come in to replace this degree of GABA agonism that ethanol was once giving this patient. And then glutamate remains elevated because, remember, we've created this new baseline activity, and this leads to a lot of the clinical manifestations we see, such as, such as excitatory states and then potentially seizures. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, a bunch of different clinical symptoms we see. A majority of the time, these will be mild to moderate symptoms in the uncomplicated withdrawal patient. And then we see a lot of these same uh, symptoms in the severe patients, but then really to classify the complicated alcohol withdrawal patient <clears throat> is really th the basis of three symptoms, alcohol withdrawal seizures, the development of alcoholic hallucinosis, and then delirium tremens. <clears throat> so it's also important to know when to expect these symptoms to develop upon cessation, cessation of alcohol. Um, really looking at the complicated symptoms, so delirium tremens, we usually see peak around four to five days, but this can occur also up to 10 to 12 days post cessation. So this, there's the, a common misperception that after 72 hours, a patient's really outside of the risk window for developing severe clinical symptoms, but that's not true. For alcohol withdrawal hallucinosis and um, alcohol withdrawal seizures, those usually peak one to two days post-therapy, so a little earlier. But realizing that DTs can present longer, a longer period of time after cessation. Looking at these three um, primary symptoms of complicated withdrawal, again, alcohol withdrawal seizures, onset within 12 hours, peak around 12 to 48 hours. These are usually generalized motor seizures. Um, status epilepticus is reported as um, presenting in 3% of these cases, but usually in those situations, there's an underlying neurological disorder. Status epilepticus is very rare as a cause from just alcohol withdrawal. Um, if the initial seizure is untreated, two out of three patients will experience multiple seizures. Um, so it is important to treat these up front if able. Alcohol, alcoholic hallucinosis and delirium tremens, um, really the big differenti differentiating factor between these Two symptoms is with alcoholic hallucinosis, the sensorium is clear, um, vital signs are stable, and it's really isolated visual uh, misperception. So seeing bugs crawling on the wall, but you have a clear sensorium. Whereas with delirium tremens, a profound confusional state, uh, hence the word delirium. With delirium tremens, around 80% of cases resolve within 72 hours of onset. The mortality drastically increases <clears throat> if the duration of um, DTs lasts beyond the 72-hour window. All right, so how do we assess our patient with alcohol withdrawal um, as far as active withdrawal and severity of that withdrawal or even predicting how severe the withdrawal may be? So we have a couple of validated clinical scoring systems the first scoring system was developed back in 1973, which is the Total Severity Assessment Scale. Um, you still see components of this scale built into our more modern scales, but this one has kind of been phased out. <clears throat> the one we use here at UVA, as far as symptom-triggered management, is the CEWA scale, or Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment. It's a validated 10-item assessment, assessment tool used to quantify the severity of a person that's actively withdrawing. Um, it's a score... Uh, less than or equal to 8 corresponds to mild withdrawal, 9 to 15 moderate, and greater than 15 severe withdrawal symptoms. The alcohol withdrawal syndrome scale is another, institu is another scoring tool that some institutions use. Um, similar to the CEWA scale, it classifies as mild, moderate, to severe withdrawal symptoms. So two of the more common tools to classify active withdrawal 
<clears throat> and usually targeted at delivering some sort of treatment modality. And then recently, um, there's been a lot of attention on this pause score, which is the prediction of alcohol withdrawal severity scale, which in contrast to CEWA and the alcohol withdrawal syndrome scale, it's used to predict if a patient will develop severe withdrawal versus classifying an active withdrawal. Um, so this was first studied in a pilot study in 2013 and then was prospectively validated in 2015. And this scoring system will be incorporated into the new UVA guidelines, um, so we wanted to introduce that to you guys here. <clears throat> so it's basically a three-part scoring system. So the first part is a yes or no question, have you consumed any amount of alcohol in the past 30 days, or does the patient have a positive BAL on admission? <clears throat> if you answer yes to this question, then you proceed with the test. And the next two parts are a 10-point scoring system. Uh, eight questions under Part B are on a patient interview, some more subjective measures, given one point each. And then Part C is two questions, one point each, more objective criteria, um, including the patient's BAL on presentation greater than 200, or is there evidence of autonomic activity? <clears throat> so how they validated this, it was they looked at 403, 403 medically ill hospitalized patients. Um, like I said, the max score on the test was 10. And what they found, as you can see in the logistic regression curve here, that they had a positive predicting value of 93%. Uh, of a PAW score of greater than or equal to four to predicting a patient develops symptoms of complicated alcohol withdrawal. Um, so this was both sensitive and specific with a negative predicted value of 99.5%. <clears throat> All right, so a quick assessment question. Which of the following is not true in severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome? A, a large imbalance in glutamate and GABA pathways frequently results in complicated alcohol withdrawal syndrome. A pause score of greater than or equal to four is predictive of complicated alcohol withdrawal. The incidence of DTs peaks at 24 hours and does not occur outside of 72 hours following cessation. And the presence of an alcohol use disorder can prolong mechanical ventilation and ICU length of stay, in addition to increasing mortality. C, correct. <clears throat> All righty, now I'll turn it over to Amanda to, to discuss management of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Right. So now that we've gotten a little bit of background on alcohol withdrawal syndrome, um, we're going to kind of focus the rest of the presentation on managing uh, this condition. So as far as goals of therapy for managing alcohol withdrawal, there's really a number of goals we need to be considering throughout the patient's hospitalization. But for purposes of today's presentation, what we're going to focus on is preventing and treating withdrawal symptoms. Um, specifically our most severe symptoms of seizures and delirium tremens, but also symptoms of sympathetic overdrive um, that Matt mentioned earlier. And at the same time, we're going to talk about ways that we can prevent any kind of complications that come with our treatment. So minimizing sedation, respiratory depression, and any adverse effects that come along with the medications that we choose. So in terms of pharmacologic agents that we have available to us for alcohol withdrawal syndrome, there's a little bit of data out there for a number of different classes of drugs, depending on what types of symptoms of alcohol withdrawal we're really trying to target. But for uh, purposes of today, we're going to be focusing on our benzodiazepines, our non-benzodiazepine GABA agonists, or phenobarbital specifically, and then our alpha-2 agonists, as Matt mentioned, dexmedetomidine. So as we start to get into the discussion about management of alcohol withdrawal, really the obvious place to start is with our benzodiazepines, because they really are a mainstay in therapy for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Now, benzodiazepines are of obvious utility in alcohol withdrawal because of their mechanism of action. So benzodiazepines, similar to ethanol, bind to the GABA receptor, albeit in a very specific benzodiazepine binding site. So as the benzos bind to our GABA receptor, it opens the chloride channel, open, or increases the frequency of chloride channel opening to allow hypopolarization of the membrane and essentially augmenting that inhibitory GABA activity that we have that's missing in alcohol withdrawal. So even though our benzos make a lot of sense for alcohol withdrawal simply based on their mechanism, how is it that they've become such a standard of care for treatment of this condition? 
And to answer that question, we need to go back to the 1950s and 1960s when the mechanisms of alcohol withdrawal and benzodiazepines were really first starting to be understood. So this was a study published in 1969. It was actually a randomized controlled double-blinded study of just over 500 Veterans Affairs patients. And uh, these patients were randomized to receive either chlordiazepoxide, chlorpromazine, hydroxazine, thiamine, or placebo. And the authors primarily evaluated the success of these therapies in terms of whether patients developed convulsions and or delirium tremens. Uh, so it might not be surprising at all what the authors found, knowing what we know today, but the patients that received chlordiazepoxide experienced significantly fewer episodes of delirium tremens, um, convulsions, or both when compared to all of these other therapies or placebo. So like I said, not surprising at all, but really interesting that um, this is the kind of the first solid evidence that we have that benzodiazepines are really the uh, therapy of choice for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So now that we've established benzodiazepines as our class of drugs of choice, which one do we pick and how do we dose it? So unfortunately, there's not really any strong evidence out there to support the use of any one benzodiazepine over any of the others for purposes of alcohol withdrawal. So our choice of agent at the end of the day comes down to thinking of properties of the drug and thinking about what's going on with our patient at the time. So I've included this table here, just kind of a little refresher um, with some properties of the benzos that we use most commonly in alcohol withdrawal. Um, so we can see some differences and think about how that applies to our patient at hand. So is this a situation that we need a very quick onset of action, or is it okay if it takes a little while to kick in? Um, what kind of routes of administration do I have available to me at the time? Is this a situation where um, <clears throat> I want a drug that's going to have active metabolites and last a little bit longer throughout the patient's symptoms, or is this a situation where I need to reassess the patient's neurostatus a little bit more frequently, so I want something a little more short-acting? So I, I wish that I was able to provide you with, you know, this is the gold standard drug to use, and this is the gold standard dose to use, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to uh, the drug and considering what's going on with our patient. So after we pick a drug, the next uh, step is figuring out how we're actually going to use it in alcohol withdrawal. And as far as the dosing goes, there's really two big schools of thought. We could use a symptom-triggered <coughs> regimen, when medication is only given as symptoms necessitate based on any of the alcohol withdrawal sy syndrome assessment scales that we have. Or we could use a fixed dosing or a scheduled regimen, when of course medication is scheduled to be given at specific intervals, regardless of symptoms, with additional doses being available for breakthrough um, as symptoms necessitate. But which one of these strategies is better? And to answer that, there's actually been a number of studies that have been done that compare symptom-triggered regimens to fixed dosing regimens. And I'll spare you from going through the specifics, and these are just three that I pulled of the many that are out there, because at the end of the day, they all have sort of say the same thing. We see very similar trends here. That patients that receive symptom-triggered therapy consistently have less benzo use overall, shorter durations of alcohol withdrawal syndrome, and fewer complications that are associated with our benzos. So they have shorter ICU lengths of stay, um, less need for intubation, less time on the ventilator. So all in all, a symptom-triggered therapy is associated with better outcomes than our fixed dosing. All right, so just a couple take-home points about our benzos. Benzodiazepines do remain a first-line treatment for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, so we're going to talk about some other agents today. Um, and interestingly enough, the available evidence doesn't clearly suggest that benzos are superior to any of these other therapies, um, but it's never wrong to use a benzodiazepine to treat this condition. We also know that using a symptom-triggered regimen is preferred over scheduled dosing because of all the better <laughs> outcomes seen with that approach. And ultimately, the choice of drug and dosing really does need to be patient-specific, thinking about routes of administration, risk factors for respiratory depression, um, organ function, just really picking the drug that fits your clinical scenario best. So it brings us to our next assessment question. Which of the following dosing regimens would be preferred in a patient with mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal syndrome? Lorazepam, one or two milligrams every hour as needed for CWA over eight. Lorazepam, one milligram every four hours scheduled, plus one milligram every hour as needed for CWA over eight. Chlordiazepoxide every six hours plus the Razepam PRN every hour as needed uh, for CY over 8, or none of the above? A, yeah, 
once again, our symptom triggered regimens um, much preferred over scheduled dosing, if at all possible. So now that I've just gone through all of the great things about benzos and how they're the standard of care, um, I also want to highlight that they're not perfect for alcohol withdrawal. There's a number of inherent issues with using benzos in these patients. First, we have issues with the drugs themselves. So we have a danger of dose stacking, especially with benzos that take a little bit longer to kick in, might tempt providers into wanting to redose prior to the initial dose kicking in, and at the end of the day, you have a patient that's too sedated. We also have, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, whenever we use benzodiazepines with more of a shorter intermediate half-life, like lorazepam, we have a drug that might wear off before the patient's symptoms resolve, so you can have issues with rebound withdrawal. We also have some concerns with the patient population that we're using them in. So there are some patients with alcohol withdrawal that might be completely refractory to benzodiazepines because of complete GABA receptor desensitization. And we also know that paradoxical reactions to benzos are actually more common in alcoholics than they are in the general population. And lastly, benzodiazepine-induced delirium does nothing but complicate this clinical picture and management and makes everything all the more difficult for, for these patients. So because of all these concerns, it's really important for us to kind of start thinking outside the box, considering alternative agents, adjunct agents, so we can try to minimize our benzodiazepine use but still treat these patients appropriately at the same time. So that brings me to the next drug that I want to talk about, phenobarbital. And this is a drug for alcohol withdrawal syndrome that um, has kind of been a hot topic at UVA lately. Um, different providers kind of using it in a little bit different ways. Um, so I just wanted to go through a little bit of the data for, for using phenobarb for this indication. So phenobarbital acts very similarly to both our benzos and to ethanol by binding the GABA receptor, but albeit this time at a different barbiturate-specific binding site and a little bit different than our benzos. Instead of increasing the frequency of chloride channel opening, they increase the duration of chloride channel opening, um, again, allowing for that hypopolarization to occur and kind of slowing down everything um, in the brain. What's a little bit special about phenobarbital is that in addition to acting on the benzoreceptor, or on the GABA receptor, what our benzos are missing is that phenobarbital also inhibits glutamate. Um, to suppress that excitatory activity that's going on in alcohol withdrawal. So this is a really special kind of dual mechanism of action that phenobarbital has that makes it a drug that's really well matched to the pathophysiology that Matt talked about um, in alcohol withdrawal syndrome and um, really makes a lot of sense that it could be successful in this condition. So since this is a drug that we're perhaps a little less familiar with than we are with our benzos, uh, I did want to take some time to go over just some PKPD parameters about it. As far as onset, uh, it's a fairly quick onset of action, five to 10 minutes when given IV or IM, and a very long half-life, upwards of three days in most cases. <clears throat> it's mostly hepatically metabolized and a good portion renally excreted, so just things to keep in mind when you have patients with that kind of organ dysfunction. And the other really cool thing about phenobarbital is that we've seen that it has very predictable linear pharmacokinetics. So this is a figure from a PK study done by Tang Mo's and colleagues in 2010, um, essentially plotting phenobarbital dose versus measured concentration. The green lines here represent the generally accepted therapeutic range of phenobarbital for purposes of seizure disorders. Um, and although the levels don't necessarily predict efficacy whenever we're using it for alcohol withdrawal, at least that we know of, um, at least this gives us an idea of what a safe range of a level might be. So obviously what the authors found here is that um, the dose correlates very well in a linear fashion to their measured level. So we can predict with a decent amount of confidence what kind of level we're going to see based on the dose of phenobarbital our patients receive. So now kind of taking our pharmacokinetics one step further, I wanted to share this study that was done by Ives and colleagues in 1991 out of UNC. And they essentially use pharmacokinetics to come up with a dosing protocol for using phenobarbital in alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And they used this paper to describe their findings. So this group started with a loading dose of 15 milligrams per kilogram of ideal body weight, the first 40% given immediately, 30% given three hours later, and the final 30% given three hours after that. They then calculated a maintenance dose, <clears throat> of course taking into account all of our pharmacokinetic parameters of bioavailability and percentage of the drug in salt form, using a goal level of 20, 
and calculated a maintenance dose. And this dose was given in divided doses um, shortly after the loading dose and then tapered off over the course of about a week or so. So now if we combine uh, the dosing used in that study with what we saw about 20 years later in the PK study, we see that that 15 milligram per kilogram loading dose in an average size male is predictably going to give us a level kind of right in the middle of our therapeutic range or our safe range. Just a couple other notes about the dosing protocol that they used. Um, the phenobarbital doses for the loading dose were given IM with the caveat that the first dose could be given IV if the patient was symptomatic. The maintenance doses were meant to be given PO but could also be given IM if the patient didn't have any GI access. And the rizopam was available as needed for excess agitation between doses. Now, unfortunately, they didn't really comment too much specifically on the outcomes of um, this study, but it seemed to be generally well tolerated by, by all patients. They did specifically talk about two um, particularly complicated sounding cases of patients that responded remarkably well to phenobarbital and did also comment that there were no adverse effects reported in the entire population that they evaluated. So that we've kind of gone over a little bit of background about phenobarbital and seen at least one application of it in alcohol withdrawal syndrome, I wanted to spend a little time looking at the data that compares phenobarbital to um, our currently generally accepted therapies for alcohol withdrawal to kind of see where it fits into therapy if we're kind of thinking in terms of a treatment algorithm of sorts. So the first study I wanted to talk about was actually done in 1978 by Cramp and colleagues. And this was a double-blind uh, comparison of diazepam to barbital, so a benzodiazepine versus a barbiturate for the treatment of delirium tremens. <clears throat> the authors evaluated patients admitted to a psychiatry unit with acute or impending <laughs> frank delirium tremens. And these patients were randomized to receive either oral barbital or IM diazepam in a double-blind, double-dummy fashion. Now, our primary objective was really to just and to provide a comparative assessment between the two therapies in terms of how they matched up in, uh, treat in administration and effect. And for purposes of further evaluation, patient symptoms were graded on a scale from one to three, grade one being the least severe symptoms of just a tremor, grade three being the most severe symptoms of tremor, hallucinations, and also disorientation. And as far as results go, there were 91 patients that were included and the therapy that each patient received was um, looked at by the evaluators and deemed to be either, quote, satisfactory or non-satisfactory in terms of administration and effect. So I get that this is really subjective, but it was 1978, so just stick with me. Um, and in the population as a whole, what the authors actually found was that there was really no difference between the two therapies, that the barbiturate and the benzodiazepine were both equally efficacious in controlling delirium tremens in this population. But whenever they looked at patients according to severity of their symptoms, what they found was that the patients with grade three or the most severe alcohol withdrawal symptoms um, actually responded significantly better in terms of effect with the oral barbital versus our diazepam. So um, maybe not the most methodically sound or robust study that's out there, um, but even from 1978, we start to see that you know, this might be a niche where phenobarb really fits in as in the complicated alcohol withdrawal, most severe symptoms um, type of patient. So now we fast forward about 35 years or so, and we see a study by Rosenson and colleagues published in 2013. And this is perhaps one of the best quality studies that I could find that uh, assesses phenobarbital's role in this um, condition. So this was a prospective, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study in which the authors hypothesized that just a single dose of IV phenobarbital in addition to standard symptom-triggered therapy would decrease rates of ICU admission. <clears throat> so this, the authors here looked at emergency department patients with a primary diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal and randomized them to receive either phenobarbital 10 milligrams per kilogram IV or placebo. Now, interestingly enough, the authors comment in their discussion that this 10 milligram per kilogram dose was actually only chosen because it was the highest dose that the IRB would approve and still let their protocol move forward. Um, so they say that it, it might not be optimal, but unfortunately they had no choice but to, to, but to go with this dose for the purposes of their study. 
Their primary objective was the level of hospital admission from the emergency department, and then secondarily, they looked at benzodiazepine use, length of stay, and adverse effects. Now, there were 102 patients that were included, and importantly, there were no baseline differences in baseline characteristics between the two groups. But also notably, baseline alcohol withdrawal assessment scale scores in both groups showed us that this was a population of patients with moderate to, to severe withdrawal at baseline. <clears throat> and what they found was that patients that received phenobarbital versus those that received placebo saw decreased rates of ICU admission, decreased use of benzodiazepines, and no differences in adverse outcomes, regardless of whether or not they received the phenobarbital. So once again, we see a, a population of patients with complicated alcohol withdrawal and the more severe end of symptoms um, that are benefiting from receiving phenobarb. So like I said, I, I really was trying to dig through the literature and come up with some really robust, high-quality studies to share with you all to um, really kind of solidify the role of phenobarb and alcohol withdrawal one way or another. But the truth is there's really just not a whole lot out there right now. But there were a couple other studies that I felt like were worth mentioning that um, <clears throat> I think really go to show and kind of shape phenobarbital's role, again, kind of thinking in terms of a treat treatment algorithm. So the first study was done by Gold and colleagues in 2007. This was a single center retrospective comparison of outcomes before and after implementation of a guideline that started with escalating doses of benzodiazepines and progressed to escalating doses of phenobarbital. Now this was done in a population of ICU patients, severe alcohol withdrawal, almost 100% of them with delirium tremens, about a third of them actually experiencing alcohol withdrawal seizures. And what they found was that after implementation of this guideline, um, they saw decreased rates of mechanical ventilation and trends towards lower um, lengths of stay in the ICU and less nosocomial infections. A couple years later, there was a study done by Hendy and colleagues. This was actually a prospective randomized double-blind trial, um, but just with small numbers and um, some baseline differences between groups. So this was done in patients that had a more mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal um, done in patients in the emergency department. A lot of them were just discharged from the emergency department. But patients were randomized to receive either oral lorazepam or oral phenobarbital. Um, so phenobarbital here in a monotherapy um, application. And what they found was that there was no difference in symptom control. Both the phenobarbital and the lorazepam um, were able to reduce CWA scores from baseline to discharge. And there was no difference in hospital admission rates. A couple years later, we see another study by Doobie and colleagues in 2014 that was remarkably similar to that first one by Gold and colleagues in that it was a pre and post comparison after implementation of a very similar protocol, escalating benzodiazepines to escalating phenobarbital, phenobarbital doses. And once again, what they saw in this ICU population, severe alcohol withdrawal, is that after implementation of this guideline, they saw a decreased ICU length of stay, decreased intubation needs in ventilator days, and overall, less use of benzodiazepines. And then finally, in 2015, there was a study by Gashlin and colleagues, again, just kind of a retrospective review comparing patients who received phenobarbital plus benzodiazepines versus those that received benzodiazepines alone. And when assessing this hospitalized non-ICU population, mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal, again, they see similar outcomes between the groups. Um, so I hope that what you're starting to see here trend-wise is that where we see these most profoundly positive outcomes of phenobarbital in addition to benzos or, or versus our benzos um, is that the ICU patients with severe alcohol withdrawal are really the ones that are showing the most benefit from addition to this therapy. And that, <clears throat> and that brings us to the most recent data that I could find on using phenobarbital in alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, this is only published in abstract form and from data presented at meetings in 2016, but um, just kind of continues that trend that we see. This is, a, again, a retrospective uh, pre-post study of ICU patients, moderate to severe alcohol withdrawal after implementation of a phenobarbital protocol. And once again, in this ICU population with severe symptoms, patients that receive phenobarbital it saw a shorter median duration of alcohol withdrawal syndrome and shorter ICU lengths of stay. So once again, we see these more profoundly positive outcomes in patients with ICU needs and more severe symptoms. Again, notably, no differences in adverse effects between the groups. 
So what do we make of all this literature? Uh, I just talked about a number of different studies. There is a lot of heterogeneity between those studies. Um, different patient populations reviewed, different dosing schemes for phenobarb used, different definitions of severe alcohol withdrawal and different scales used to assess it. Um, so how do we bring it all together and come up with some conclusions? So I feel like we can take home a couple of points here. Number one, I think that phenobarb works for treating alcohol withdrawal syndrome. This is something that the literature consistently demonstrates, that it is at least as efficacious as benzodiazepines across various patient populations. Um, we've seen it be effective both as monotherapy and as an adjunct to benzodiazepines. I think our next takeaway is that phenobarbital is safe for treating alcohol withdrawal syndrome. You know, this is a drug that is old, that we're less familiar with than our standard benzos. So everybody gets a little bit nervous about using phenobarb. Um, but the studies consistently show that there are really no differences in adverse outcomes compared to our benzodiazepines. And there are some studies that, as we've seen, potentially show decreased needs for mechanical ventilation and decreased needs for intubation when using phenobarb in these patients. Our third point, I think what you can see from the studies is that phenobarbital likely has the greatest utility in more severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, not saying it's not going to work for mild to moderate, but I think that that's really where its niche is. Getting back to its mechanism of action, thinking about those patients that might be completely refractory to benzos because of their GABA receptor desensitization. Um, so phenobarbital is probably going to work best in our severe, complicated alcohol withdrawal versus the uncomplicated patients. And lastly, as pharmacists, of course, we care a lot about dosing regimens. Um, but unfortunately, I think the dosing, optimal dosing regimen for phenobarb really is yet to be determined. Um, we've seen a number of studies use it successfully in different ways. So we've seen our single IV IM loading doses of 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram um, be seen as a safe and effective approach. Sometimes they employ a taper, sometimes they don't. Again, both have been shown to be safe and effective. But we've also seen strategies of dosing that involve dose escalation based on symptoms. So giving doses of 65 milligrams, 130, 260, based as symptoms necessitate. That's also seen, been seen to be an, a safe and effective strategy. So I'm curious to see what will uh, come up in the literature in the next couple of years as far as supporting any one dosing regimen over any of the others. But I think as of right now, there's a lot of right ways to do it. And kind of as Matt alluded to, um, we are in the process of updating our institutional alcohol withdrawal syndrome guideline, and phenobarbital is going to have a role in it in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we're still in the process of kind of hashing out all the details with all of the groups involved. But what we can probably expect to see is um, a regimen that starts with a loading dose. I think we're actually going to go more on the 6 to 10 milligrams per kilogram IM uh, side followed by a short PO taper of sorts, kind of similar to that very first pharmacokinetic study that we talked about. But again, nothing's finalized yet. We're still kind of working on all the details. And just to kind of wrap up this section with a couple of words of caution before we all go out and start using phenobarb for everybody. Um, respiratory depression is a commonly cited adverse effect of phenobarbital, so it's a, a worry that everybody is thinking about. But this risk really hasn't really been consistently documented in the alcohol withdrawal syndrome literature. So this respiratory depression risk likely comes from using phenobarb for other indications and the studies that are out there for that. So potentially different dosing regimens, higher levels, so on and so forth. I think it's also important that we don't forget about drug interactions. Again, because this is a drug that we don't use as often as others. So don't forget that phenobarb is a strong inducer of some CYP enzymes, a major substrate of some others specifically noting our interactions with other anti-epileptic drugs that can be particularly problematic. And also keep in mind the potential for synergy when used with our benzodiazepines. So remember, they both act on the GABA receptor, but they affect that chloride channel in slightly different ways. And benzodiazepines increasing the frequency of chloride channel opening, phenobarb increasing the duration of chloride channel opening. Um, so there is the possibility of synergistic effects when using the two together. And lastly, just thinking about organ function and keeping that in mind. Um, probably best to avoid altogether in fulminant hepatic failure. And just using with a little more caution in patients with uh, you know, cirrhosis, renal failure, and stage renal disease. Maybe be a little bit more vigilant about checking levels um, and just kind of knowing what to expect as far as how long the effects of the drug are going to last in those patients. 
Which brings us to our next assessment que question. So which of these patients is likely the best candidate for phenobarb to treat their alcohol withdrawal syndrome? So A, an 84-year-old female reporting one glass of wine a night, admitted with a UTI and currently confused. B, our 52-year-old male reporting 1.5 liters of liquor intake daily, currently experiencing tremors and hallucinations and telling you that he's had DTs in the past. C, a 25-year-old female reporting a recent binge of two bottles of wine daily for three days, but a current CWA score of two, or none of the above. B, yep, so once again, our, our complicated alcohol withdrawal patient is the one that we're likely going to see the best response with, with phenobarb. And now I'll give the floor back to Matt, talk about dexmedetomidine. Thank you, Amanda. All right, so we'll real quickly run through uh, dexmedetomidine, review its role, potential role in alcohol withdrawal. And I think it's important to note up front before we dig too deep into this, that this therapy should be viewed in a much different light than phenobarb or benzodiazepines, and that it's more of an adjunctive therapy um, to a GABA agent in that it doesn't target the underlying, primary underlying mechanism of alcohol withdrawal, which is that GABA glutamate imbalance. And really, it comes down, the reason it's an adjunct therapy is due to its mechanism of action. So it targets an alpha-2 adrenoreceptor agonist, um, which ultimately reduces norepinephrine release. So you can see in this um, figure to the right, this is an alpha adrenergic neuron. The synaptic vesicle re releases norepinephrine, which binds to alpha-1 receptors to enact its mechanism of action. Dexmedetomidine agonizes the alpha-2 receptor, which triggers a negative feedback loop and um, prevents additional release of norepinephrine. And this is really um, targeting the alpha-2 uh, 2B subunit is where we get the sedative properties that we see with dexmedetomidine. And it's eight times more potent than clonidine for this, um, the subset of this receptor. And it's the 2A receptor that leads to a lot of the hypotension that we see, which is why we see more hypotension with clonidine than we do dexmedetomidine. And it has somewhat of a favorable, pharm favorable pharmacokinetic profile with a pretty fast onset and offset half-lives around two hours. Um, there have been basic science studies that have shown um, correlating the degree of norepinephrine release to the severity of alcohol withdrawal, some pointing to an hypothesis that uh, the excess norepinephrine uh, agonizes excessive glutamate activity, um, but really the primary mechanism uh, of dexmedetomidine uh, is reducing this hyperadrenergic response that we see. And then an additional benefit is that provides sedation without respiratory depression. So looking at the complicated al alcohol withdrawal patient, potential benefits of this therapy, we mentioned decreases autonomic hyperactivity, the ability to provide a cooperative sedation, which we've seen uh, as its use as a sedative in the ICU, um, being a benzodiazepine sparing agent, um, so minimizing over sedation of potential ben benzodiazepine stacking, lowering the risk of intubation, decreasing the incidence of a secondary delirium, delirium, and then decreasing, potentially decreasing ICU length of stay. Potential concerns with this treatment, as we mentioned, it doesn't treat the primary mechanism of alcohol withdrawal, so this should always be viewed as an adjunctive treatment to a GABA agent. Um, we shouldn't use this as monotherapy. And then does it have the potential to mask a SIBA score, which is based on these hyperagenergic symptoms? That may be a potential concern as well. And then, as we've seen with its use as a sedative, the hemodynamic derangement, such as hypotension and bradycardia that we see with this agent. And then econotoxicity. As pharmacists, we should always evaluate therapies. Is this a potential cost-effective treatment? No, and I think that's yet to be determined. Okay, so we'll review uh, a lot of the literature with this drug and these patients. And I was really surprised when I did a literature search for this um, talk in the number of studies there were out there evaluating the use of this agent in complicated alcohol withdrawal. Uh, as a forewarning, a lot of these studies um, are lower quality evidence studies, so more so case series and controlled cohorts. Um, but there actually are three prospective randomized controlled trials within the past couple of years that we do have to help us uh, guide the use of this agent in this population. Um, one being a dose range study and the other two evaluating two separate protocols. Um, and then another forewarning as we work through these studies, 
keeping in mind that there's a large variation in study protocols, so it's hard to compare these to one another. Um, so they really should be evaluated individually. And really the variations existed in three separate areas. So the threshold for adding dexmedetomidine, the definition of what a severe alcohol withdrawal um, is, and then standard of care benzodiazepine protocols and uh, overall dexmedetomidine utilization, in including titration and when to wean therapy. Okay, so the first study, one of the first studies that um, was provided in the literature was a pre-post retrospective analysis of 20 uh, patients admitted to the ICU. They looked at uh, dexmedetomidine for benzo refractory severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Um, they reported outcomes compared 24 hours pre-post dexmedetomidine initiation. So each patient was evaluated at the time dexmedetomidine was initiated, and then they looked at outcomes 24 hours pre-initiation and post-initiation. They, they chose to use the alcohol withdrawal severity scale as their scoring system of choice, which we mentioned earlier that this is a validated scoring system. Uh, and then they also reported benzo requirements and measures of autonomic activity. So as you can see in this graph to the right, uh, the gray bar going up the middle here is times zero when dexmedetomidine was initiated. And then they marked outcomes 24 hours pre in one hour intervals and then 24 hours post in the same one hour intervals. This dark line was the average alcohol withdrawal score, so the severity of their uh, current withdrawal state. Uh, and they showed a, a, a positive reduction in this scoring system post dexmedetomidine initiation with a reduction near 20%, and then also a reduction in benzodiazepine usage following dexmedetomidine initiation, um, a difference in 52 down to 20 uh, milligrams of benzodiazepine equivalents. Uh, their secondary outcome was measures of autonomic hyperactivity. So you can see we have average heart rate and systolic blood pressure on the left or on the y axis, on the x axis, we have the same. 24-hour pre and post timeline. Uh, up top, we have average systolic blood pressure. So they showed a, a significant reduction in uh, systolic blood pressure by 9.6%, and then also a significant reduction in heart rate by 22.8%. So significant in reducing benzodiazepine requirements, the severity of the withdrawal state, and then also improvements in autonomic hyperactivity. So some promising results from this retrospective review. Some limitations of this, they didn't define what benzo refractory withdrawal. So did these patients receive two milligrams of benzo equivalents and then went to dexmedetomidine, or did they receive 50 milligrams? They didn't define that. And then they had no protocol for when they initiated or how they titrated dexmedetomidine. So then uh, CRISPO and colleagues published in Pharmacotherapy in 2014 another retrospective study. This was a uh, controlled cohort study at two institutions. Um, they looked at continuous infusion benzodiazepines, uh, included 33 patients in that group versus 28 patients in the dexmedetomidine group, and then both groups received a PRN benzodiazepine protocol. <clears throat> and they looked at uh, Richmond agitation sedation score uh, as a surrogate for efficacy, and that's how they titrated dexmedetomidine as well. Um, Outcomes, they looked at incidence of intubation um, and seizures as their primary, and they showed no difference between groups in each. Um, benzodiazepine equivalents, uh, DEX group had a significant reduction in the quantity of benzos reused, but the number of PRN um, requirements was higher in the DEX group, um, but this was compared to a continuous infusion benzo, so not too surprising. Um, the time until a sedation score was less than positive one, uh, similar between groups, hypotension and bradycardia, um, higher in the dexmedetomidine group, which we'll begin to see a trend in this outcome within these studies, and then hospital length of stay was unchanged between groups. So really the takeaways, no effect on intubation or length of stay. Um, uh, there is the potential for a benzodiazepine sparing effect, but we didn't really see the clinical uh, positive clinical outcomes from that effect. And then maybe as monotherapy, dexmedetomidine may blunt that hyperadrenergic response that composes our SIBA score, and that's the reason we saw this decrease in PRN benzodiazepines. Um, 
then higher incidence of bradycardia hypotension, and then an increased total drug cost in the dexmedetomidine group. Okay, following this, in the same year, we had our first prospective study. So this was a, a double-blind, placebo-controlled dose range study. So they had an increasing method, they had an interesting methodology. So basically, they took 24 patients, randomized them to one of three groups, eight in the placebo group, eight in a dexmedetomidine at 0 0.4 um, rate, or, and then eight in the dexmedetomidine at 1.2 rate. So they had standard flat rates for each of these patients. So dexmedetomidine was not titrated. Um, this was a single center, and then they also received symptom-triggered benzodiazepines on top of each of these therapies. So they noted in the dexmedetomidine um, group, so for their primary outcome of benzo requirements in less than 24 hours and seven days, they used both, benzo, or both dexmedetomidine groups as one to get an aggregate score just to increase their uh, patient population. So within 24 hours, they showed a significant reduction in benzo use, but no difference when they extended that out to seven days. Um, and this was limited by a mean dexmedetomidine duration of less than three days. Um, and then 80% received the infusion for at least 24 hours. So most of our dexmedetomidine group was receiving this from one to three days. Um, similar occurrence of moderate to severe CEWA or Riker sedation scores, um, higher incidence of bradycardia in the dex group, and then no effect on intubation or seizures, as we didn't see these in either population. So really the takeaway is Based on this study, no dose response effects. So the group that received a low dose dexmedetomidine didn't really show any difference to the higher dose dex. Um, and, but it wasn't powered for this endpoint. So I would take that with a grain of salt. Um, initiating dexmedetomidine early in complicated withdrawal reduced short term administration of benzodiazepines, but we didn't see this uh, for extended duration. Um, they didn't assess the prevention on intubation, as a majority of these patients were already intubated when started on Presidex. Um, and then less severe withdrawal symptoms leading to lower CEWA scores was likely driven by lower benzodiazepine requirements. Um, so following this study, another retrospective case series, single institution, they defined um, severe, uh, severe alcohol withdrawal uh, as receiving greater than one dose of benzodiazepine plus initiating dexmedetomidine, titrated to a RAS of 0 to minus 2. They compared benzo use and hemodynamic measures 12 hours pre and post dexmedetomidine. Um, they looked at median cumulative benzo use, which was reduced significantly in the dexmedetomidine group, or following dexmedetomidine. The lower mean arterial pressure uh, following dexmedetomidine and then lower heart rate as well. So potential improved hemodynamic profile, and then reduced benzo requirements. So similar outcomes that we've seen in previous studies up to this point. Um, looking at another retrospective review the following year in 2015, uh, another single institution review, looking at severe alcohol withdrawal, um, receiving continuous fusion dexmedetomidine. Uh, but where this was different when the, uh, from the others is they compared it to continuous infusion propofol or continuous infusion lorazepam. And really what they found was Presidex decreased the length of mechanical ventilation and decreased ICU and hospital length of stay. No real details provided on the actual protocol and how they, and how they titrated dexmedetomidine. All right, in 2015, we got our second randomized controlled study. Um, they evaluated whether the addition of dexmedetomidine to benzodiazepines was effective and safe for severe withdrawal. Um, so they randomized 72 patients, 36 to a dexmedetomidine group, 36 to a diazepam uh, PRN CWA triggered group. Um, one was excluded in the dex, dex group for insufficient symptom control compared to four in the diazepam group. Um, the dexmedetomidine infusion was started at either 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 mics per kg per hour titrated to a RAS score and a CEWA score. Um, so you had to achieve both uh, measures of sedation there. And then 10 milligrams of diazepam, diazepam IV PRN CEWA greater than 15 after titrating dexmedetomidine. So they would titrate dex up to a max of 1.4 and then consider benzodiazepines. Um, 
And then this was compared to a symptom-triggered diazepam regimen. Uh, what they showed is they showed a reduction in 24-hour benzo consumption in the dexmedetomidine group. Um, they showed a reduction in cumulative benzo dose during the ICU stay, a improvement in percentage of time in target sedation. Um, uh, patients requiring use of additional sedatives was lower in the dexmedetomidine group, but this wasn't significant. Um, and they also looked at a nurse-assessed patient communication um, score, which was improved with the dexmedetomidine group, which we know dex provides a cooperative sedation, so maybe not surprising. Um, patients that received haloperidol, lower in the dexmedetomidine group, uh, and then they noted no severe adverse effects in e either group, including seizures. Um, another retrospective review later this year looked at severe alcohol withdrawal defined as a CWA greater than 8, plus greater than 8 milligrams of lorazepam. So we see yet another definition of what a severe complicated withdrawal is. Um, and then they looked at uh, whether early initiation of DEX, so within 60 hours of hospital admission, plus a, a PRN benzo protocol um, provided benefit. Um, and they looked at six hour interval dose density requirements of benzo benzodiazepines up to 24 hours prior to an inflection point. Um, so what they did is they looked at a controlled cohort of benzodiazepine groups and took the six hour interval of when the most benzodiazepines were given, used this as the inflection point, and then looked at 24 hours pre and 24 hours post, and then compared patients that received dexmedetomidine. So you can see here, looking at benzodiazepine requirements, you can see the inflection point was here. Um, so the red group is the benzodiazepine PRN group. Um, so they were, and then the DEX group is the blue line. So they received the same uh, six hour lorazepam equivalents at the inflection point. Um, then 24 hours pre, um, benzodiazepine usage was similar. And then post DEX, you can see the blue here is much lower than the red, showing a decrease in benzodiazepine requirements. Looking at um, hemodynamic measures, so heart rate was significantly reduced in the DEX group and then systolic blood pressure was initially reduced upon initiation and then uh, evened out over the 24-hour course to the benzo group. All right, so takeaways from this, um, dexmedetomidine showed decreased, decreased symptom-triggered benzo requirements, 12 hours of therapy versus matched cohort, um, and trends towards significance at 24 hours, increased incidence of bradycardia, and then no difference in our uh, standard um, clinical outcomes of ICU and hospital length of stay, mechanical ventilation, and hypotension. And then most recently um, is a, one of our strongest uh, methodological studies. This was published as an abstract. Um, they have not published this, the full manuscript yet, so it's difficult to fully evaluate this, and they didn't fully go into detail of what their dosing protocol was. But basically, they looked at a multicenter randomized placebo controlled protocol um, in severe alcohol withdrawal patients, um, comparing benzodiazepine based versus benzodiazepine plus DEX. Um, the DEX was initiated at 0 0.4 mics per kg per hour and titrated to a max of 1.4. They used the Minnesota detoxification scale um, for their titrated level of sedation of less than 14 uh, and a RAS score of 0 to minus 2. Um, and they determined a power uh, to detect a 30% reduction in ICU length of stay. So looked at 49 patients. Um, the groups were well matched, except their uh, detox score was higher uh, in the placebo group, so maybe a sicker patient population in this group. Um, take it as you may. The primary endpoint, ICU length of stay, no different between groups. Um, secondary outcomes, delirium-free ICU days, no difference. Then average daily uh, benzo dose equivalent, no difference. So a little bit different than what we've seen in some of our retrospective studies. Um, secondary outcomes, respiratory failure, um, respiratory depression, and MMS scores, uh, no different at discharge. Um, interestingly, they did an anxiety score in both groups and found that the patients that received dexmedetomidine um, versus placebo actually had higher anxiety. 
uh, which was interesting. Um, and then median hospital costs were not different between groups. So their conclusion was um, using DEX in addition to benzos did not result in reductions in ICU length of stay, benzo use, respiratory failure, hospital cost, which some of these outcomes we did see positive benefit in some of our retrospective studies. Um, and then while potentially underpowered for length of stay, these findings do not support adjunctive DEX for alcohol withdrawal. Um, I take that lightheartedly until I can see this full manuscript and their full protocol, but um, this seemed to be the largest prospective study that we have so far. All right, so taking all this into account, how does this fit into clinical practice? So the first question we have is, what patients and when do we decide to initiate dexmedetomidine? Um, so like we mentioned, this should never be used as monotherapy as it doesn't treat the underlying mechanism of alcohol withdrawal. So always adjunctive therapy to a GABA agent, whether that's a benzo or phenobarbital. Um, that's up to a team discussion. Um, but really, like phenobarb, this probably has the best benefit in your severe alcohol withdrawal patients. Um, and this, as we discussed, using a PAW score to predict severity of greater than 4 or CEWA greater than 15. Um, how do we titrate it? There was a large range in protocols in these studies, and a lot of the protocols weren't um, provided in detail, so they didn't discuss this, um, but likely initiate somewhere in the range of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 mics per kg per hour, titrate to a RAS score of 0 to minus 2, or in response to a CERA trigger, as this is primarily focused at reducing the number of benzodiazepines patients receive, and then likely a max dose of 1.5 mics per kg per hour, which is what we use in our sedation protocols. What to monitor in these patients, as we saw as a common trend in these studies. Um, hemodynamic derangements was common, so decreased blood pressure, heart rate, so we obviously want to mo monitor these. Um, then the level of sedation. Most commonly, these studies used RAS scores and CEWA scores, um, and that's what our institution endorses, so that's what I would recommend. Um, when and how to wean. This is less clear. There is very little detail provided on how they these studies determine when to take off dexmedetomidine and make this transition. Um, do you use a benzodiazepine requirement threshold? So whenever patients require this amount of benzodiazepines, do we start titrating off dexmedetomidine? Do we trend CEWA scores and use that as our threshold? Or is it a defined time period? Do we say we know when, how long these symptoms are supposed to last? Do we use dexmedetomidine up to 48 hours and then try to wean off? I think that's yet to be determined uh, by future studies. But really, the use of dexmedetomidine in these patients comes back to this primary mechanism. So you have a patient that's admitted with complicated alcohol withdrawal. They're going to receive a GABA agent, whether that's benzodiazepines or phenobarbital up front, as their primary treatment. If it's benzodiazepines, one of the current concerns that we've seen in uh, previous published literature is this dose stacking phenomenon. Patients get benzos, maybe they get a benzo-induced secondary delirium. The symptoms of that can coincide with the symptoms of severe alcohol withdrawal. So you keep giving benzos and you get in this cyclical pattern. Potentially adding dexmedetomidine to a benzodiazepine can help break this cyclical pattern and reduce your number of PRN benzos. Okay, then we'll end with one assessment question and get you out of here. Which of the following patients would likely benefit most from dexmedetomidine therapy? So MJ presents the ED complaining of the shakes. He reports drinking 12 beers per day for the last five years. Stopped cold turkey six days ago. He's being admitted for the treatment of alcohol withdrawal syndrome and received a pause score of two. JM returned from a bachelor party where he binge drank for 72 hours straight. He is complaining of nausea, a headache, and elbowed his nurse in the ED. TJ just returned from Vancouver vacation in Cancun where she drank a margarita with every meal for six straight days. She is complaining of GI symptoms and a fever, is being admitted for further workup. Or KT presents as a transfer where he presented with a PAW score of four, <coughs> diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal. He reportedly drank a liter of liquor daily plus a few beers for the past 10 years, received 14 milligrams of lorazepam in one hour on route to UVA. D, yeah, I would agree. So really, getting back to similar indications for phenobarbital therapy, really classifying this complicated withdrawal. All right, so in conclusion, um, 
Benzodiazepines remain a first-line therapy for alcohol withdrawal, as Amanda mentioned. Uh, and really, we should be focusing on the symptom trigger approach over to scheduled regimens. Um, phenobarbital has been shown to be a safe and effective option. Uh, more positive outcomes versus benzodiazepines in the complicated withdrawal patients, but we still have a lot of uh, detailed information to find out about this therapy. Um, and then lastly, dexmedetomidine, potential benefit in combination with a GABA agent. Um, clinical outcomes still need validated and more rigorous prospective trials, but we do have some data to help guide this um, therapy currently. And then, as Amanda mentioned, we'll, we do have uh, alcohol withdrawal guideline updates coming out soon, so stay posted for those. All right, any questions? Hey, um, so I guess my question is with the, sorry, this is too loud, but uh, for the phenobar, are, what is going to be the recommendation if patients have symptoms on top of the protocol that's already coming out? Because I know they have the scheduled doses, but one of the issues is what are we going to do when patients are still having symptoms? Um, I know that's an issue on the floor. But. Yeah, and unfortunately, I can't really speak to a whole lot of that right now. That's one of the big points that's still being decided, whether it's more appropriate to use additional PRN doses of phenobarb and stick with the monotherapy route, or if it's more appropriate to um, use our benzos in addition. Um, I think right now the group is kind of leaning towards sticking with one drug and using PRN phenobarb doses for breakthrough agitation, um, whether that's going to be oral doses, IV doses. Um, I am doses. I think that um, there's still a lot of discussion to be had, especially with nursing concerns and monitoring concerns. So um, that's kind of what we're leaning towards, but it's, it's going to be one or the other. I don't have a great answer right now. Sorry. No, that's, that sounds good. <laughs> I was just curious because mm -hmm. I don't, you know, on the floor we don't know which one to do when right. patients come out on the bar. So. Yeah, and the literature has shown um, both monotherapy and adjunct to benzos being effective, so I don't think either one is wrong. I think it's just whatever the group kind of decides to go with. Um, thank you for the um, presentation. I was in here in the beginning, and you may have already said this. Is this only going to be ICU-focused, or are we going to see this on the unit on the floors as well? This is an institutional <clears throat> protocol, so this will or institutional guideline. Um, so this will apply across the board and kind of is really just an update to our current IC or current um, alcohol withdrawal guideline that we already have. And just to add on to that, um, I know a lot of what we focused on was a lot of the ICU uh, specific treatment modalities. But I think my personal opinion, one of the benefits of potentially using phenobarb on the floor may be preventing an ICU admission. Um, I think where we see a lot of our ICU patients in alcohol withdrawal being admitted from the floor is due to this excessive need for benzodiazepines, risk for respiratory depression. So if you can use an agent like phenobarb that potentially has a better kinetic dynamic profile, <clears throat> can allow for uh, main maintenance of respiratory status while an ease through the withdrawal period, I think could potentially lead to a reduced ICU admission. but. That's probably yet to be determined. And then to just keep in mind, too, that it is a guideline and not a very strict protocol. So, of course, there's going to be dosing recommendations in there, but there's nothing that says that you must use this dosing um, and you can't stray from the recommendations in the guideline. That was a, a really good presentation. Thanks a lot. Lots of good literature uh, that you guys presented. So, as far as this going on right now, I believe that it's in the ICUs, am I right? No, it's not yet. We don't have any kind of mm -hmm. guideline protocol, nothing like that. It's it's really just provider specific. Um, it is being used. Yes. Occasionally, if I prefer, yeah. yeah, depending on the providers. Okay, so it's not on the floors in the ICU. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So with all of this and kind of where we're going, would you recommend us to go ahead and recommend phenobarb to sure. these really severe patients in the ED? Yeah, yeah, based, based on the literature, I mean, um, I would kind of treat it as any other therapy. If I think it's appropriate, I'd for sure go ahead and make that recommendation. Yeah, because that'll be a definite practice change for us. Yeah, I think, I think you'll have a lot more support once the <coughs> guideline does finally go through and, and take effect, um, and people are just educated about it a lot more. But I think in the meantime, it def definitely doesn't hurt to make the recommendation.
Yeah, and I think just to add on to that, um, <clears throat> one of the things we may see as pharmacists on the back end of these orders is in the transition from service to service, so say phenobarba started in the ED, then they go to the floor. If that floor team's not familiar with phenobarb, we may get a lot of questions as pharmacists, how do I manage this, what is this? So I think understanding uh, the potential place in therapy and how to help guide practitioners would be helpful because I have a feeling we'll be doing a lot of education um, as far as this practice is concerned because there is a lot of unfamiliarity with it, uh, which is causing a lot of concern with um, certain groups. But I think going back to what Amanda said, once everybody's educated and becomes familiar with this, I think it will be a nice uh, treatment modality. I just want to mention that if people are thinking about recommending this that we currently have in our um, institutional IV guidelines, um, parameters around the use of IV phenobarbital, so mm -hmm. just kind of be aware of that. And it does limit the dose that you can give at one time, mm -hmm. um, partially because of the concern of respiratory depression, but also because phenobarbital does not um, go into solution well with anything, so you can't put it in a bag and hang it. Um, so it has to be given an IV push, and it has to be given an IV push very slowly. Um, I don't know what the parameters are for IM administration, but it's just something that I wanted to mention before we all leave here and start. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so th that is something to stress, too, that um, whenever this guideline does go live, we are going to, going to be recommending the IM, if at all possible. Um, of course, there are some patients, you know, super low platelets, you know, no muscle mass that can't get IM. Um, so in that case, the IV, we would have to take into account all of that monitoring. Um, the monitoring is currently one of the big discussion points uh, on IM administration and um, whether it involves the same level as mo of monitoring as the IV form and um, whether that's possible on the floor versus in the ICU, how intense that is. So all to be determined. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.